Tonight on Quest, elephant seals dive deeper, swim farther, and hold their breath longer than almost any mammal. Find out what scientists have learned about how they accomplish such remarkable feats. Also, why is the universe expanding? A mysterious force called dark energy could be behind it. And for more than 80 years, the Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct has been supplying drinking water to Bay Area residents. Now, crews are trying to rebuild the water system before the next big earthquake. Support for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, Hope Lab, the David B. Gold Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Capsonell Foundation, the Vadez Family Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, and the Smart Family Foundation. Support is also provided by the members of KQED. Quest is a project of KQED Science. Every winter, thousands of very loud, large visitors storm the beaches of Año Nuevo State Reserve, a jagged stretch of coastline 60 miles south of San Francisco. 50,000 tourists a year trek along sandy dunes and past coastal brush to glimpse these massive marine mammals during their breeding season from December through March. Over there, you see an alpha bull fighting another guy who wants to be an alpha bull. Elephant seals are the largest seals in the world. Male northern elephant seals can be up to 16 feet long and weigh up to 4,500 pounds. Brawn trumps brains as the males fight for the much smaller females who congregate in harems dotting on your Nuevo, which was named for the New Year's Day in 1603 when it was first spotted by Spanish explorer Sebastian Vizcano. Nearly 5,000 elephant seals congregate at Año Nuevo State Reserve during the breeding season. It's a testament to their astounding comeback from near extinction 100 years ago. The animals were exploited for their uh, blubber, which was reduced to a very fine oil. By the 1890s, only about 30 elephant seals survived. Confined to Isla de Guadalupe, a volcanic island off the coast of Baja, California. In 1922, scientists from the California Academy of Sciences made a survey of rare animals on the island. They found a small herd of elephant seals. A few months later, the Mexican government declared the island a protected reserve. All of the 170,000 elephant seals that exist today trace their lineage to the 30 individuals that survived on Isla de Guadalupe. Today, the population of northern elephant seals is robust, with breeding colonies scattered from Point Reyes National Seashore to Baja, California. And for male elephant seals, mating is a high-stakes game with few winners and lots of losers. One male may monopolize mating in an ideal situation with up to 100 females. With their noses inflating with air, the males trumpet their battle call. These fights to gain access to breeding females can be brutal. But as scientists at UC Santa Cruz discovered, the encounters allow male elephant seals to learn the distinctive calls of males they fought with before. If a male won an earlier fight, it will move toward the sound of the losing seal, ready to take it on. If it lost, it will scamper away, avoiding another fight. Athletic may not be a word that springs to mind when describing these blubbery beach visitors, and yet they can dive and swim past much of the marine competition. Elephant seals are really animal Olympians. When it comes to diving, the only other group of marine mammals that even come close to them is the sperm whale and beaked whales. They're diving to routinely between 1,500 and 2,000 feet of water, and occasionally they'll dive for almost two hours. 
elephant seals also travel twice a year, up to 12,000 miles to forage for food such as fish and squid. So studying them when they're underwater for most of their lives requires high-tech tools. And if you go to this textbook from 1990 on pinnipeds, here's where we thought the distribution of northern elephant seals, up from Vancouver Island up here, down to the middle of Baja, California, and then a few hundred miles off the coast. Once we put a satellite tag on the animals, we found that elephant seals were using virtually the whole northeastern Pacific Ocean. We had no idea this is what they're doing because the animals are underwater and you just don't see them. Today, this seal surveillance has met the digital age. Since 2000, Dan Costa and his students at the University of California, Santa Cruz, have tagged more than 500 elephant seals. I'm involved in a project called the Tagging of Pacific Predators, and it's a project which takes the approach that we've had with elephant seals, but magnifies that to look at how the northeastern Pacific Ocean is used by different species of marine animals, not just marine mammals, but marine birds, sharks, fishes, and turtles. The tagging is revealing how critical certain regions of the ocean are, not only for elephant seals, but also for the survival of their marine neighbors. There's a group of animals, elephant seals, northern fur seals, uh, salmon sharks, and albatrosses all feed in this region of the North Pacific transition zone. It's this region between the colder and warmer waters of the North Pacific. So this is colder water here, warmer water, Hawaiian Islands, and all these little squiggles or worms or northern elephant seals. And you can see that they're, they really like this area on the, the sort of cold water side of this, this big system. And we call these fronts just like we have a weather front coming in in the atmosphere. None of this groundbreaking research would have been possible without innovative tags, which keep getting smaller and smarter. This tag just measures time and depth. This tag just gives us animal location, so it transmits to Argo satellites overhead. This tag tells us where the animal is, what it's doing, and gives us much higher quality locations. I have to hold these two things together, this does it all. We can dial up via the internet and find out where the animal was when those data were transmitted. The satellite tags are giving us a much deeper, richer understanding of where these animals go and where they lived and where they spend their time. Today, Dan Costa's students prepare for the returning seals and the clues they carry about their lives at sea. We're at Año Nuevo State Reserve in Northern California today, and we're here to recover satellite tags from an adult female northern elephant seal. So on a typical day where we're retrieving a satellite tag, we locate the female that we've been watching. And as we sneak by all the seals, we're um, getting ready to give an initial injection of a mild tranquilizer, basically to make the seal fall asleep so we can safely retrieve the tags. Uh, 46 X. And then we check the health of the animal. And looking at her, she's probably about 500 kilograms. So she's quite a large northern female elephant seal. She's off. Someone read it. 547. 547. We start taking measurements like blubber thickness, blood samples, and we also take whiskers. This essential fieldwork is also a reminder of the cycle of life and loss which marks the breeding season. She did not have a pup with her. She has given birth and we have observed her for multiple days with a pup, but sometimes in the craziness of the harems with male fights and things, they lose their pup. <laughs> High-tech tracking tools and old-fashioned fieldwork are helping lift the ocean's dark veil to reveal the secrets of the seals. But some secrets remain. If you have a female that goes out to the International Dateline and turn around and come back like a beeline and finds Ani Nuevo Reserve, how does she do that? How did they die for two hours? What's the metabolism? How do they change their ability to store oxygen? How do these animals take the pressure. <laughs> it always amazes me that after all these many years of studying these animals, that there's still so much more to learn. It's what drives me. It's what drives a lot of us that do this.
Let me tell you a bedtime story, a different kind of bedtime story. It begins, we think, almost 14 billion years ago with a very hot, dense beginning. And we call it the Big Bang. And it expanded many fold, all of a sudden, very fast. But then something happened. That rapid accelerating expansion stopped and it just started to coast. And in fact, it continued to expand and expand and expand vastly, but slower and slower and slower for some 7 billion years. And then things shifted again. Around 7 billion years ago, we believe that something started to speed up the universe. And this is where we are right now, living in a universe that is accelerating, expanding faster and faster. Now, if you're one of those people who are just now discovering that the universe is expanding, let alone accelerating, don't feel bad. Even Einstein, in his theory of gravity, assumed that the universe was static. If somebody hadn't told you that the universe was expanding, it would just seem pretty unlikely, right? I mean, if, you know, if you just sat and thought, what kind of universe could we live in, the first thing that would come to your mind would not be a universe that was actually getting bigger and bigger. I think you're only driven to that when you actually see the data. Above the UC Berkeley campus at the Berkeley Lab, physicist Saul Perlmutter is one of the researchers who have actually seen that data. For nearly 20 years, he's helped reshape our understanding of the cosmos. Some forces we are familiar with. Wind makes the clouds drift along. The moon helps drive the ocean's tides. And something is causing the galaxies to rush away from each other. Researchers believe the something that is pushing the universe apart makes up 70% of the fabric of the universe. But they're literally in the dark about what this something is. And so they've taken to calling it dark energy. It's very exotic. It's very strange. And the strangest part, right, is that it's 70% of reality. 70% of the stuff in the universe is this thing that we just do not understand at all. If you're starting to get a little uneasy about the fact that two-thirds of the universe is unknown, rest assured, scientists out there are looking for answers. I, mean, I think I was, I was just one of those kids who always uh, thought that we should know how the world works around us, that you know, here, we, here we live on this Earth and, and we don't fall through the floor, and somebody should have given us an owner's manual about how, how the whole thing fits together and how you use it. In 2011, Perlmutter shared the Nobel Prize for discovering that the expansion of the universe started to accelerate seven billion years ago. But what exactly does it mean that the expansion is accelerating? First, you have to understand the universe is infinite. Just imagine that you are living here on a galaxy and there's galaxies forever going that way and there are galaxies forever going that way and there are galaxies forever going that way in all directions, nothing but galaxies, no end, and just imagine that there's sort of a typical distance between those galaxies. And the only thing I mean when I'm saying that the universe is expanding is that we're sort of pumping extra space between the galaxies. And when we say it's accelerating, we just mean that that extra pumping is happening faster and faster and the, and the distances are growing bigger and bigger more and more quickly. So how did Perlmutter's team figure out the history of the universe? They did so by looking at the light from supernovae, stars that exploded billions of years ago. Hey. How's it looking? Uh, it's looking good. We've, um, uh, the weather's good. Telescope has uh, been released and we're Sitting actually, in a room uh, at the Berkeley lab, Perlmutter and physics student Hannah Swift are connected to one of the world's largest telescopes, the Keck 2 in Hawaii. The other half of their team is actually in Hawaii. What? <laughs> I said we're curious as to what's for dinner. You know that Chinese place? <laughs> Just... How's the, uh, what, what the odds look like for tonight's for the weather? I, I think it looks good. I think we're definitely going to get data. Uh... Their plan for the night is to confirm that five supernovae, previously identified through another telescope, are the type 1A supernovae they need for their research. The type 1A supernovae explode in a very similar way every time. And so they brighten like fireworks and then fade away, but they reach the same peak brightness. Their predictability makes these exploding stars what researchers call standard candles. Their initial brightness is constant, and it grows fainter with distance. And since researchers know light always travels at 186,000 miles per second, they're able to calculate how long ago these supernovae exploded. 
when a supernova explodes, the light starts spreading out in all directions, uh, much like the, the uh, ripples on the water spread out when you drop a pebble into the lake. The supernovae Pearl Mutter studied exploded billions of years ago. So as the light from the explosion was traveling towards our galaxy, our solar system had time to develop, dinosaurs had a chance to come and go, and we humans made our grand entrance and had time to build our telescopes. As the star moves away from us, one other thing happens to its light. Because the universe is expanding, the light waves stretch. While the light is traveling to us through the universe, the universe is expanding. And everything in the universe that's not nailed down expands with the universe. And that includes the very wavelengths of the photons of light that are traveling to us from the supernova. If the object is moving away from the observer, it will appear red. In astronomy, this phenomenon is known as redshift. One way to visualize these stretching wavelengths is to look at how waves of sound, which are similar to waves of light, change. Can you hear how the pitch of the honk changed as the sound source moved away from you? This is because its wavelength is stretching. The same happens with supernovae's light. Now with these two ingredients, the brightness of the supernova and how much the light has been shifted towards the red in its appearance, you now can just read off the history of the expansion of the universe because the brightness tells you how far back in time any given supernova event occurred. The red shift, as we call it, tells us how much the, super, the universe has expanded since that time. And now we just do this for 5, 10, 20, 40 supernova at different times back in history. And they, one after another, tell us for each time in history how much the universe has stretched since that time. I think I'll do the following. I think I'll start another explosion when this is complete and then look what it, see what it looks like and then I'll abort it if, if well, depending on what, what it looks like. Okay. But even though astronomers have become the historians of the universe, they can only speculate about what's causing this stretching. One example of a slightly more exotic explanation could be that there's extra dimensions in the universe beyond the three dimensions that we're aware of of space and the one dimension of time. It's possible that there are other dimensions that we just don't usually experience. Perhaps in some way we're limited to the, the dimensions that we experience, um, but that other things like perhaps gravity could not be limited, and maybe it can seep in to one of these extra dimensions. And that would make it look to us as if it was becoming diluted, that you're having less effective gravity, and perhaps um, that's one of the reasons the universe could be accelerating. Or the accelerated expansion could actually be caused by an entirely new form of energy. So long as dark energy continues to be a mystery, it's unclear what the future of the universe might be. For now, Perlmutter is enjoying his privileged vantage point. In some sense, um, we may have found just the right spot to, to come to. So we are at just the right scale to be able to enjoy looking out at the infinite space above us and down into the microscopic world beneath us. Um, we're, I think, at just about the right time in history to be able to look back at the early, hot, fiery Big Bang period and project into the future of what we might get to see. In some sense, we're in a very cozy medium, and uh, I think it's a, a nice place to be. Less than a mile from Mission Boulevard in Fremont, engineers with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission are descending deep underground to inspect the progress on a new tunnel. We will have to tie in this piece right here in the shaft first, weld this in place, back foot concreted. This nine foot diameter tunnel is now open, carrying on average 62,000 gallons of water a minute each day to four Bay Area counties. It's a key step in upgrading and replacing parts of a system that has served the Bay Area for 80 years. We're here at the New Irvington Tunnel. This is one of the most critical pieces of our system because when we're done and we put this tunnel into service, it's going to carry water that served 2.6 million people in the Bay Area. 
Dan Wade is the director of the Hetch Hetchy Water System Improvement Program. At a cost of nearly $5 billion, it's one of the largest engineering projects in the nation. The New Irvington Tunnel is steel lined and it has a concrete reinforcement and that ensures that we have a reliable earthquake resistant tunnel well into the future. The San Francisco Public Utilities Commission is in charge of making sure the taps keep flowing with this water. It originates 167 miles away at Hetch Hetchy Reservoir in Yosemite. But much of the system was built in the 1920s and 30s. Today, a major earthquake could leave parts of the Bay Area without water for a month. One of the primary goals of the Water System Improvement Program is to ensure that within 24 hours after a major earthquake, we will be able to deliver water to the customers. And to pay for it, water rates have been going up, way up, for the system's customers who live in San Francisco, San Mateo, Alameda, and Santa Clara counties. One third of the customers live in San Francisco, and so they're going to pay one third of the bill, and the other two thirds will be paid by our customers outside of San Francisco. San Francisco residents will see their water rates approximately triple by the time the program is done. The voter approved program began in 2004 and is scheduled to end in 2018, but there's urgency to get it done. We have the Calaveras Fault, the Hayward Fault in the East Bay, and then of course the San Andreas Fault on the peninsula, and our water system crosses all three of those major faults. The U.S. Geological Survey a few years ago predicted that by 2035, there's more than a 63% chance that there'd be a major earthquake here in the Bay Area. So we're truly in a race against time. Caesar, you got a copy, Caesar? The work is on track, and occasionally even ahead of schedule. One of our most impressive projects is the New Bay Tunnel, a five-mile pipeline underneath the San Francisco Bay, and it's the first true tunnel that's been constructed underneath the bay. To help shield it from the shaking during an earthquake, the team built this new tunnel in a bed of thick clay 100 feet beneath San Francisco Bay. It replaces two pipelines built in 1925 and 1936 and carries water from the East Bay to San Francisco and the peninsula. The Hetch Hetchy water system has been serving us very well throughout the 20th century and into the 21st. However, the infrastructure is old, um, it's aging, it's in need of repair or replacement or upgrades. With most of the roughly 80 upgrades and replacements done, the construction crews are hard at work on the toughest and biggest project of them all. Calaveras Dam was built in 1925. It forms Calaveras Reservoir, which is the largest local reservoir that's part of our system. We needed to permanently restrict the reservoir level to about 40% of capacity. This new dam is being built near the Alameda Santa Clara County line out of earth and rock like the old dam. The new dam, however, will be seismically stronger, which will allow the Calaveras Reservoir to fill to capacity 31 billion gallons. California is in a severe drought. We need this reservoir for drought carryover storage. The program has a goal of meeting a drought period of seven and a half years to ensure that we can continue to supply water to our customers in that length of drought. As bulldozers excavate dirt and rock to carve out the 220-foot tall dam, long buried treasures from the Bay Area's prehistoric past are coming to light. Every day I come out here, I'm very excited. I get to look for fossils from creatures that lived 20 million years ago. Today we found two vertebra from a whale, probably between the size of a large dolphin and a killer whale. In the past, we found shark's teeth. This is the tooth of a megalodon. It's a prehistoric shark that lived um, about 20 million years ago. This individual, based on the tooth size, would have been about 25 to 30 feet long. To date, we have over 650 fossils. Nearby, the crew scour the valley's walls to make room for the new watertight foundation. But a reminder will still stand of what was once the world's largest earth and rock dam. 
when this new dam is complete in 2018, we will actually cut a notch and remove about one third of the existing dam so that the reservoir can come up against the face of the new dam. Dan Wade and his team are more than halfway done replacing the dam, a critical step in protecting Hetch Hetchy's water from a big quake that could strike at any moment. Water is a precious resource. We cannot live without it. We're doing something that's going to have a lasting effect to ensure the long-term health and safety and economic viability of the San Francisco Bay Area. Support for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, Hope Lab, the David B. Gold Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, the Vadez Family Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, and the Smart Family Foundation. Support is also provided by the members of KQED. Quest is a project of KQED Science. A KQED television production.